do when you get to have this job is you get to introduce people that you really admire and respect, and I've gotten to do that so far a bunch of times, and today, um, I think you already got to meet her, but I'm going to introduce my boss, Gwen Heistand, who's the Director of Education for all of ACR, and she's also a biologist at the Martin Griffin Preserve and has lived and worked there for 15 years. And um, Gwen comes from a theater background. She actually went into the business world and was, um, she had some pretty interesting and high-powered jobs in the business world and she has a really great story about how one day she decided to trade in her pumps and pantyhose for <laughs> hiking boots and uh, hand lens. And um, she told that story at our, we have a summer camp for young women, high school age women who are looking to um, go into conservation science. She told that story and one of them said, you mean you don't have to figure out exactly what you want to be and do that whole thing your whole entire life? <laughs> which is a pretty good message. Some of my best friends still haven't decided what they want to be when they grow up. Um, Gwen did her master's and then a bunch for her doctorate at UC Santa Cruz, and she did Santa some- Barbara. Santa Barbara, I knew that. <laughs> UC Santa Barbara, and she, she did some pretty interesting studies, and she's, she's very broad as a naturalist, but she's especially interested in the small and easy, easily overlooked things. Um, so you'll get to see her again on the day that we learn about, you'll actually get to see her again a lot throughout this class, but you'll get to see her again on the day that we learn about spiders. Um, anyway, I'm hoping you'll tell us a little bit more about yourself as you do. Um, we're really lucky to have her here today. She's a total ally for you in your education journey and you'll get to see her. Um, many times. So, oh, and one more thing, you know how um, Dave and Joe both were winners of the Terwilliger Environmental Education Award? Yeah, we got three in a row. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a warm welcome for Gwen Heisen. Yeah. To stand in front of them or hold the same thing. Um, how many people were watching the videos that was playing while you were using Randy? What was that? Cool. Yeah, it was actually, and I'll show it later, maybe, you know, have it running in the background, but I thought it'd be cool to kind of watch it. Um, it was video that was filmed by people who are entomologists, but also fly fishing people. I think it was a couple. And so it was actually views of the insects um, from the trout's perspective. And you know what's happening with the hatching and all of that. And what's really interesting is when I found it, I sent it to my sister-in-law, who is a, a, an avid trout fisher, fly fisher woman. Um, and I got this phone call, and I picked up the phone, and all I hear is like, <laughs> and I'm like, Jocelyn, what's going on? She's like, you really get me. <laughs> watched this video more than 50 times and it has improved her trout fishing, her fly fishing, you know, immeasurably. So we can have a little bit of fun with it later, but I just wanted to ask people who are getting settled to sort of get to see what's going on because today we're talking about the creek. We're talking about, you know, I don't know how many people have memories of childhood around water. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I spent so many happy hours playing around in our, in our pond and our stream and our creeks and, um, and loved it all. And it's one of those things that actually has a lot of juice for kids, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of a natural, like, curiosity magnet. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about water. Um, something that all of us, you know, depend on, but we don't necessarily think about it all that often, although we're starting to think about it a little bit more. Um, then we're going to talk about some adaptations that the things that live in or on water have, um, and spend a little bit of time about specific critters. But then one of the things that's so great, and I think the mentors will agree with this, is that the time at the creek is like one of the times where you can kind of let the kids explore. It's one of those times where when you're keeping track of time, 
you're keeping track of time, but what you're doing is you're creating this like timeless world for them. They don't get that timeless sense all that often. They don't get that sense these days anymore of you know just sort of being out there and you know we've divided time up so much in our modern world that you know like all of a sudden you know you have to know that it's Tuesday and then you have to know that it's 11 o'clock on Tuesday and then you have to know that it's 11 15 on Tuesday and then you have something in five minutes and you meet somebody at the post office and it's like oh I'm gonna hug you but you know I have something where I have to be here you know so one of the things I love about the creek and one of the things I love about this program and one of the things I love about all the work that folks do and you will be doing is that we get to play around a little bit with that a little bit but how do we provide that sense of timelessness? And I love hearing the comments. You know, all of us have these things. I have these things. You're going to notice it today. I, you know, I get positively, like, insanely excited about little things that live in water. <laughs> and I want to say everything that I possibly can about them. Um, and when you're out on the trail with the kids, there'll be things like that that you have. But hearing, you know, that sort of recognizing, okay, well, that's not necessarily where the energy is. Let's watch where the energy is. Let's watch where the curiosity is. Um, it's just so great that, that we're actually modeling that for the kids and allowing that to infiltrate your <laughs> judging nature by common sense or likelihood. We wouldn't believe the world existed. Um, so what I'd like you all to do right now is to shut your eyes. And while your eyes are shut, to think about one person that you really care about. And think about, you know, all those little things that they do that might, like, drive you a little nuts. And those things that they do that absolutely warm your heart. The things that you like to share with them, how grateful you are to actually have that in your life. Just really get an image and a sense of that person. Now you can open your eyes. So what's one thing that all the people that you thought of have in common, besides the fact that they're people? Curiosity. Curiosity. I the thing that I'm thinking of is that they're all um, almost three quarters water. <laughs> I never thought of that. I saw that That's what we're thinking about today. I mean, you know, I, I love there's a, a line in Thoreau where he was watching a trout in Walden Pond and he, he refers to it as animalized water. So if you think about it, we are all sort of beings that have figured out how to leave water and take the water with us. And we're these little aquatic ecosystems ourselves that have, you know, more things that aren't us living in and on us than actually are things that are us. And so um, one of the things that, we, that we're going to talk a little bit about today is how cool water is. Yeah. So if you look at it, 65 plus percent of the human body is water, 70% of the brain, 82% of the blood, and 90% of the blood. And what does that water do for us? Keeps us alive. What else? Everything. 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 Yeah. Forms saliva, which is part of our digestion. Our membranes are moist. Our body cells can grow, reproduce, and survive. It flushes waste. It lubricates joints. It's the major component of most body parts. It's needed by the brain to manufacture hormones and neurotransmitters. It regulates body temperature. It acts as a shock absorber. It converts food to components needed for survival, for digestion, and it helps deliver oxygen all over the <coughs> um, body. And I will tell you, a lot of the slides that you're seeing today and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, you will get a little trail booklet that um, has like identification of the creek critters and stuff, but in it a lot of these slides are actually there are the concepts, so you know you don't need to basically notes. And the thing that's so cool is it's almost exactly the same percentage of us that's water is the amount of water that's on the planet. So um, it's just something I like to think about. I like to think about what questions come up for me when I think about that. 
And there's some cool exercises. I have one in the little booklet um, that you can do at lunch on the trail with the kids, where you can start slicing up an apple and having, you know, sort of talk about the percentage of that apple that's actually drinkable water. And there's directions for how to do that. So what I'd like you all to do now, and not until I finish talking, um, is every table has a glass of water in the middle, and every table has some eyedroppers and some pennies. And so what I would like you all to do, but not yet, is <laughs> take an eyedropper and a penny, and before we get going, what you're gonna do is you're gonna see how many drops of water you can actually fit on the penny. And so do we have any guesses, guesses now? And if you have done this before, um, mom's the word. <laughs> 25. 25. 10. Yeah, this is a good time. Yeah. When? 15. Huh? 15? 18? 27. Oh, I didn't know you were out of here and take it. This would have been the number I would have checked. Well, I had a minute here. 35. 35. Always the last time. All right, so we have a range right here of 1 to 35. Um, and so one of the things that I like about this is that you can actually carry it in your pocket if you would want to do it at lunch with the kids. I mean, usually out there we're just wanting to look at the things. But, um, but little things that get them thinking about what a hypothesis might be and what, you know, asking questions. So now we have a whole range of ideas in terms of how many drops will fit on this penny, you can start thinking about, well, what might cause someone to think one, or what might cause someone to think 35. Um, and as you're going about this exercise, I would think about what other things you might ask about as you're setting up your own personal experiment. So one thing before you start, um, most of the tables are pretty solid, but sort of deploy, um, good penny drop water etiquette and not trying to take the tables while folks are like, you know. So go ahead and have at it. We can see that the range is not 135, it's actually here, this room is 16 to 62. Um, so what do you think might be a couple of the things that you're thinking about this if you were designing an experiment that you might want to think about to make sure everybody's measuring the same thing? Yeah. Well, every penny's probably a little bit different. Every penny's probably a little bit different, it's true. So maybe you would want to make sure you had all new pennies or something. Yeah. We were wondering if heads or tails made a difference. It does make a difference. I forget in which way, so that would be an interesting thing. But, you know, there's different little things on each side that's going to cause a difference there. What else? Also, how to drop the drop. How to drop the drop. I heard over here that they were cheating. They were having small drops. <laughs> of the eyedropper? The angle of the eyedropper. The angle of the penny. How, how, how <laughs> flat it actually yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. What else? The frequency of how quickly it is. The frequency might make, uh, make a difference. Oh, okay. Just a little just because if you did the drops and you could put them around and then just make like a snail. Uh -huh. Oh, shape. Yeah, so how they're actually like bonding with each other, yeah, might make a difference. Yeah. What else? There's like a big thing that was the first thing. The first time I did it, I was like, well, of course people were different because like all the eye are different, right? <laughs> so yeah. with the quality of the waters. Yeah, like the temperature. Oh. Well, the temperature. I don't know that that would play a huge role. Um, so what is it that allows 62 rocks or 35 rocks to actually um, stay together on the surface of a penny? What is it about water? That surface tension. Surface tension. And what is it about surface tension? I mean, what, what's going on with water that water makes sense? Water adheres to water. Water adheres to water. And why is that? The 
people like think back to like yeah, the Mickey Mouse water molecules. One end is positively charged and one end is negatively charged. So we have these hydrogen bonds that make water this like wild wild thing. I mean, if somebody from outer space came and like they had never seen water, I mean, think about what would happen if you tried to do the same thing with alcohol. You know, nothing. So water has these properties, these hydrogen bonds, and as a result of that, it can do all sorts of amazing things and amazing things for us. So what are some of those things? It affects its density. And it can say more about that. So, the, when, uh, so ice floats. Ice floats. What else do you know that if it goes from <coughs> liquid to solid, it gets lighter? I mean, and, and if you think about the things in water, how does that, the things that are living in water, how would that affect them, actually? I mean, what will survive? They can survive under it. Imagine if, like, you know, if things just froze from the bottom up, we wouldn't have um, lake ecosystems. Or and volume changes. If it freezes, it expands. It expands. And part of that has to do with, like, the way those hydrogen molecules are positioning themselves. What else? It transports up trees. It transports up trees. And how does it do that? What's going on there? It's so cool. So one of the things that we were getting at was surface tension. And remember, water, part of the things that cause that is water has the ability, um, what they call cohesion, like it can stick to itself, and adhesion, it can stick to something else. And so when you have cohesion plus adhesion, you get something called capillarity. And so if you think about putting like a glass tube and you know I don't know how many people did this when they were in grade school or sorry but you know we did it with different um, putting a glass tube in a beaker of water that has a like, red dye in it or something and you can see depending upon the size of that glass tube the water rising up the tube if you did the same thing with alcohol that would happen right um, so that ability to stick to itself and stick to something else allows it to actually, you know, flow through our body and rise up trees and do all sorts of things. What else um, that does the, those, the peculiar properties of water give us? Evaporates. Evaporation. Evaporation, yeah. I mean, other things evaporate, but, you know, water, because of those hydrogen bonds, is sort of holding on to those bonds, so it takes a lot of energy to get it to um, change state um, and to evaporate. Um, and that is, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later. What else? Yeah. It changes density in terms of the fresh water or saline. You know. Saline water, and the whole saline water, say something a little bit more about that. We often refer to water as the universal solvent. solvent. So what it's able to do is it's able to, you know, um, incorporate other molecules within it. I mean, I'm not going to get into the chemistry necessarily, but as, a, as an organism or as something in the water, living in the water, how would that be beneficial for you? If water is able to have these things dissolve in it. It carries nutrients from the cell. You can get your nutrients. And one of the things we'll talk a lot about is how things that live in water get their oxygen. You know, if oxygen is dissolved in water, calcium, and things that, you know, they need for their shells or, you know, a lot of that stuff. So um, let's just see how many we hit. Water, wow! <laughs> Talked about hydrogen molecules. Here's that whole capillarity, you know, hydrogen bonds, cohesion, and adhesion, which allows the, you know, all of the nutrients and stuff that flow through trees. Um, here's what the molecular structure of frozen water looks like. Here's the molecular structure of liquid water, and here's the structure of vaporized water. So what's actually happening? The whiteboard. Oh, the whiteboard. Sorry about that. Teaching 101. <laughs> get things out of the way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just sort of a, an interesting thing, universal solvent, we talked about that, salt. Has a high specific heat.
So it takes a lot of energy for water to actually change temperature. So if you wanted to, you know, be able to have something that, you know, live in, a, in an environment that didn't have wild fluctuations in temperature, I always think, you know, the difference between coming here sometimes in September, October, versus where I live down at the Bolinas Lagoon. I left one day here with the Conservation Science Intensive where it was, I think, 101 here, and I got home and it was 50 cents. <laughs> so, so water does that for us, right? And it takes a lot of um, energy to actually get it to vaporize. Here's our little ice cube and the fish being able to swim because it's frozen on the top. So knowing all of that about water, you have the other one of the other things I want to mention that we didn't really talk about is um, what what color is water? Oh, it's the color of water. It's transparent, isn't it? So that might play a role in terms of if you were something that was living in water and you were smaller and whatever. Um, so you all have paper on your table. You all have markers on your table. And what I want you to do is to just spend not a long time. I'm going to give you, oh, let's say five minutes. I need a little bit of time on this. But I want you to become group designers. And I want you to design a creature, not necessarily a real one, um, design a creature that can live in or around fresh water. Figure out how it breathes, how it moves, how it has food, how it looks predators, how big it is. Where does it hang out? Does it hang out here so um, And you can get as wild as you want. One of the um, groups, can we just please, one of the groups that um, did it, Last, one of the last times I did it, um, they were having difficulty actually, it was actually, it wasn't the people in the class, it was our training committee or mentors, and there was one that was saying, come on, we can, we can do this too, like, and they came up with uh, something that looked an awful lot like a baseball that lived in McCovey Cove, and all of the stitches had something, and all of that, you know, so you can get as wild as you want with this, but I just want you to think about those characteristics of water water needed to adapt to the post that it was living in and then recognize the fact that it needed to get back to the water. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> okay, this table back here. Okay. Oh no, I think that okay. we tried to cover everything. Um, so again, this creature is frog-like. It has know, appendages, that's the word we were using, that allow it to swim, or to walk on land, or to fly. <coughs> um, so, um, it has gills, it has nostrils, so that when it's on land they can open, and it can breathe. Um, it has antenna that are green and um, branching, so it sort of looks like seaweed, so it's a, a, a way of camouflaging. Um, and it has a tongue to catch its prey. It has eyes on top like a fly. And it's really cute. <laughs> it's clear. It's clear. Oh, it's clear. A vivious, nocturnal, insect-like creature. Uh, it has uh, it has a solar panel in a sense where it will uh, absorb the light during the day and it'll glow at night. Uh, it has uh, eyes like a, uh, a fly, so multi-visual you know, around its, its area. It has gills so it can go under the water. It has seven uh, legs. The seventh one is like a false tail. The legs are multi-appendages with barbs that can kind of climb and all that. Like and when it matures, it actually has wings and that false, uh, that false tail will turn into more of a Look at that one. <laughs> sort of like the upside down one. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember spending all of this time, like, deliberating, like, okay, if I have a choice, wings or gills? Wings or gills? <laughs> you know, I love the water so much, and, you know, some of these actually have both. Um, and the cilia. 
So let's talk a little bit about the networker people kind of getting things. One of the things I like about it too is, is that it kind of always transports me more to like, okay, you know, this is kind of more the way I thought when I was nine. You know, <laughs> that whole being able to take in light. I remember, I think I was a little bit younger than that. I, I just learned about photosynthesis and I think from my mom, not from school. And I would go out in the back and I would take as much grass as I could and chew and chew and chew and chew and chew until my green spit. And then I'd rub the green, chew and chew and chew and rub the green and chew and chew. And then I'd lie in the middle of the 50-acre field in the back of our house trying to photosynthesize. Like, oh. If I make myself green in that discussion, and those kids that you know that are coming out here, we want to get them thinking like that. So. Here's some crap. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what's involved in the ecology of conversation. Uh, Lauren Isley, did you have people red hair? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, he said if there's magic on this planet, it's contained in water. And there's a piece that I used to read when I did this class. I'll actually maybe um, send it to Julia so that you can all get it. And he tells a whole story about his sort of relationship with water and how it was hard to him. Overcame it. Anyway. What is this a picture of? Sucking in the Is this actually a people know water fern, Azola, that looks like duck weed that covers everything? Yeah. Um, this is a super close up picture of that. It's actually a fern, and, a, and that's one little drop of blood. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the ecology of what's going on in the stream. We want to think about the stream in the context of the bigger picture. So here is Stewart Creek. Here's the Sonoma Creek watershed. And Stewart Creek empties into San Pablo Bay, which empties into San Francisco Bay, which enters into the Pacific Ocean. So those drops of water that we're looking at, um, they're making their way to the ocean. And when you look at Boobery and Stewart Creek in particular, you know, um, this is the sort of sub one that, the sub basin um, that, we're, that we're in here. And this is, I like this um, definition by John Wesley Powell. You can get into all sorts of hydrological definitions of what a watershed is. As he said, the area of land a bounded hydrologic system within which all living things are inextricably linked by their common water force and where as humans settled, simple logic demanded that they become part of a community. So we are part of this community that Stewart Creek is also part of and all of the things living in Stewart Creek and we're going to get to go there and play around today. So let's talk a little bit about the habitats in a stream or a um, river. You know that there's like places where stuff is getting deposited. You can find pools. You can find these runs. You know where the water is flowing. And this picture is actually in your little handout. Um, sometimes when the run is going over little stones and stuff, it creates riffles. Um, and there's erosional zones and depositional zones where parts of the bank are, you know, getting eroded and parts of the bank are building up. So if you think about things that live in water, live in a stream, um, how might this structure dictate what you see where? Yeah? yeah. Well, um, I'm thinking of my husband and I went through kayaking and um, I remember uh, a depositional zone would probably be a shallower area. Uh, so I'm thinking with more silt, so shallow, warmer, uh, slower flow of water, a lot of small um, rocks and things like that, most likely. Um, the erosion of zone is <coughs> when you've got to go around the corner and you've got to push all the way over into the far bank because it's rushing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Usually deeper there, darker, cooler. Yeah, so the things that live there would have to be able to handle that. Things. Yeah, what else? Well, would you find the same things in pools as you would in riffles or runs? Mm -hmm. And what might be different? Oh, no voice that. Can you show the insects? 
pools versus Yeah, so there's going to be different insects in pools versus the ripples. And one of the things, you know, thinking about water as a universal solvent, what might be different in a pool versus a ripple? So the oxygen and the temperature will be different. The oxygen and the temperature will be different. Whatever adaptations you have for clinging or swimming would have to be different. Um, so think, yeah. And um, the, the growth of the plants. The plants. Yeah. On each side. Yeah. Will be different. And what about when you're looking at, you know, a, a stream? You know, when we look at like a pond or, or we look at, you know, just a field or a woodland. Um, what's the base of the food chain? You know, when you talk about a food chain out in the oak woodland or you talk about the, a food chain. What is the base of the food chain? What is, you know, what's creating the energy? The plants, the primary producers. Do you see a lot of plants growing inside a stream or a creek? So what do you think the base of the food chain is there? Animals. Well, but animals can't take sunlight and turn it into energy. And algae doesn't really like, you know, it's even flowing pretty fast. Yeah? The decomposition of leaf matter. So it's things falling into the stream and things eroding. That's what a lot of the shredders and the collectors and the filters are actually eating, you know. So the, so it's a little bit different, the base of the food chain and the creek. So let's talk a little bit about stream critters and how they breathe. Um, and where you might find them before we go out there. So how do stream creatures get their air? From this picture, what would you say? How would a water strider be getting oxygen? Directly, Directly from the atmosphere, right? From the air. What about um, a mayfly larva? Looks like it's still surfaces. Yeah, or what are these like little things here? Yeah. Those are gills. Oh, uh, so it's actually getting dissolved oxygen from the water. Right. What about so this? So that's why they're constantly in motion from the water. Yeah, and what's really interesting is if you find a clay larvae and you put them in a little, you know, your frisbee or a little pan or something, um, you know, as it's in there and it warms up, the oxygen starts to get depleted in your frisbee and you can actually watch the speed with which they move their gills get faster and faster and faster and they just get more oxygen down into the water. Um, what about this, this little predaceous diving beetle? It's got a little bubble. It's got a little bubble. So it's going up and it's getting air. And it's, it has, um, a lot of these creatures have something called a plastron. Um, so they have these special hairs that create like surface area that just like their penny drop, a drop of water can attach to that. And so they go up, get a bubble of air, it attaches to that plastron. Some of them, it's underneath their wings. Some of it, like the back swimmers, you can see it on there. Um, and so how would that work? How would a bubble like, attached to something work if you wanted to use it to breathe? Hmm? Surface tension. Partly surface tension, keeping it together. How would they use it? How would they use it? Yeah. Yeah, so they have like trachea, the, the, the entrance to their breathing system that is exposed underneath that bubble of air. And what happens as the you know oxygen moves out of that air and it, the concentration gets depleted, oxygen from the water is going to go in to replace the oxygen that's depleted. So it actually will act like a diving bubble for a while. And also what's happened is that nitrogen is going to go out, but there's not as much dissolved nitrogen in the water. So the more oxygen is going to come in to replace the space that was left by the by the nitrogen again. So, so it's acting like a, a diving bubble and they can actually use it for quite a while before it becomes depleted and they have to go up and collect it again, which is pretty amazing. A lot of things are doing that. What about what about this thing? <laughs> it has a siphon. What is this thing? I love this thing, and I always love talking about it. And the thing that I super love about it is it's been found in Stewart Creek. We actually have a picture of something from one of these. It's one of the things I love to call people that I'm pissed at. <laughs> you know what it is? 
It's the larva of a serpent fly, one of those flies that looks kind of like a bee, and it's called a rat-tailed maggot. <laughs> you rat-tailed maggot. <laughs> and you can usually tell like a, a fly larva because most fly larvae breathe through their butts. <laughs> and what is what is this creature doing? Looks like pushing down. It's actually piercing. There's a lot of aquatic plants that have um, special tissues um, that store the oxygen. They end up they're partially submerged. So this is actually another fly larva. This one is kind of a mosquito, but there's others that actually know that they can pierce into those aquatic plants and actually get the oxygen from that tissue in the plant. So pretty, it's pretty amazing in terms of all the different ways. And one of the things when you know, you're out there um, looking at these things is I think it's really cool to try and figure out, well, how does this one actually breathe? Is it symbiotic with the plant? It doesn't harm it. It doesn't seem to harm it. I would imagine if a plant had like masses of them all over the plant, impact it. But I've never really seen um, that. Yeah. So here's a picture of a rat-tailed maggot from Stewart Creek. <laughs> rat yeah. Rat-tailed maggots actually need, you know, sort of quieter water and stuff. So this, I think, was found in one of the, you know, where, like this time of year where we have more quiet pools and things are more dried up, um, sort of in one of the quieter pools. Yeah. So we talked about this. Um, they need to use atmospheric air. So there's the diving bubble. Um, what about this? A lot of times we find these midge larvae that are red. How would they be? extracting or using oxygen from air. Why is our blood red? <laughs> right, and it's holding that one of that one of the reasons is that of that is to hold oxygen. So that's sort of similar there. Here are mosquito larvae, once again, fly family breathing through their butts, but you know, they have that little siphon where they're using the surface tension to say stay suspended, hanging upside down, called wrigglers. Uh, mosquito larvae are mosquito larvae are also often called wrigglers. Wrigglers. Whereas the pupae, which we'll see a picture of later, um, are called tumblers. Um, here are some creatures that actually are small enough that they can. This one is small enough that it can actually get its oxygen through diffusion. Um, here we have a mayfly with its gills, and here we have a newt larva with its gills. Yeah? Does the creature on the left have lungs or does the oxygen go directly like into it? Directly into, it's just back and forth, you know, it's small enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons I asked, like, what, what happened when your creature ate things is because <laughs> here you can see the digestive system of this little, um, what is called sometimes a water flea or daphnia, um, and it had eaten something that was yellowy green. I did research in a lake in Santa Barbara where too long to go into the store, it's a super cool lake. But it had this purple sulfur bacteria that would hang out right at the, basically the thermocline and the oxycline. When we were doing sampling, you could always tell when we got there because when we pulled those up, all of the digestive systems were hot pink because of the purple sulfur bacteria that it was eating. And there is that really plant. So does that mean that, that, uh, that they are sort of kind of the category of critters that can eat out certain spills and all things like that and digest salt? Well, the sulfur bacteria, and bacteria are more the things that are living off of the sulfur and the things that are eating them. Um, and then one other thing, one other bunch of things that I want people to think about. So, you know, how the, how the animals get their air, but also where in the whole system are they? Are they plankton? Are they nectar? Are they newstom? Are they benthos? Have people heard these words before? Yeah. Plankton. Mm -hmm. yeah. plankton, maybe, though. Yeah. Plankton. What are plankton? What does that really mean? Little things, and it's basically at the mercy of the currents. So things that aren't, even if they have propelling things or whatever, they can't really um, move around um, so often. So here are some plankton. You know, that, that 
that little Daphne I was talking about, Coke Paws. I bet you if we scooped up some water up at Cougar Pond at any one particular, you know, when it was, we'd find a ton of like little Coca Pods with their little egg sacs um, and their antenna. Um, and then it's also plant plankton that's out there too. And one thing that's kind of cool, we'll spend just a couple of minutes on this because it's not necessarily something that you're going to be able to show the kids. But there's things that, to me, like when it increases the wonder quotient for me, I feel like I have like a little bit more to work with. And, you know, I went back to graduate school when I was 40, and I had seen a lot of things. And then there were a couple things that just completely rocked my world. I mean, you know, I'd be sitting in a lecture, and I'd be like, no, are you kidding me? And that, one of the things was when I started learning about the physics that are operating on things as they get smaller and smaller in a fluid environment, something that we call um, as the Reynolds number gets lower. And so what that is is it's like the sort of inertial forces and the size and everything versus the viscous forces or how thick the fluid is. And when things get small enough, it's like a completely different world. I mean, think about doing a breaststroke, right? You can get through the water, you can swim through the water. Now think about if you were swimming through super thick molasses. You would do that, and then when you did this, you'd come back, and that, and you would do this. So you actually have to, like when you think about things that have like um, flagella, what they're doing is they're actually corkscrewing through that really viscous liquid. So there's like, there's a whole different thing that's going on with these things in the water that, that is super different than the way that we're used to thinking about it. Um, yeah, and I, this, this is actually a cocoa pod. I spent an entire summer, one summer at Friday Harbor Labs um, up in the San Juan Islands through the University of Washington tethering cocoa products. Which, you can't drink coffee. <laughs> you just can't shake. And you know, putting them on these like tables that were no movement was happening and they were tethered. And what I was doing is I was measuring what they were doing in terms of the flow around them. And oops, look at that. They have these like little tiny um, legs that they're beating at a constant velocity. And what that does is it creates these different um, velocity gradients around their body that is sort of like home for them. So they know what that's like when nothing's there. And then they have these antenna that are sticking up. And so when anything comes in and deforms that, they can tell if it's a predator or a potential mate. They understand by the shape of the deformation um, what's actually happening, which is kind of cool. So you can see these like little, what are called toroidal vortices, these little shapes. That was what it looked like when a female swam by, and the male would know to go after it. So we don't need to get into the detail of this, but I'm just telling folks that all of these things that are living out there have these different adaptations that are wild, that you know, they figured out how to, how to do this. So let's talk a little bit about the nuston, that term. Those are things that live in the air-water interface. Right? So those are things that are losing that surface tension. Um, and what I want to, I'm going to talk about this, then I think maybe we'll take like a 10 minute break, come back, finish up for about 20 minutes and go out, because it looks like people like, might need to get up and walk around a little bit. <laughs> so um, what is this? People know what that critter is? It's a beetle. And if people have seen, have you been out there and you see those beetles that are like, you know, like the whirling beetles? Mm -hmm. So that is a master living at that air-water interface. The surface coating on its upper part is hydrophobic. The surface coating on its lower part is hydrophilic. So it loves water, it hates water. It's actually floating right here at the surface. Its eyes have been divided so that they basically look like they have four eyes. Two of them are up in the air. Two of them are facing down in the water. And when they start swimming at certain speeds, they're creating these um, you know, ripples that go out that they also are using the water like a sensing device. And they can tell when things are deforming those ripples what's going on. That's one of their ways of um, figuring out. What about? a water strider. That is also the air-water interface. And what do you see when you're looking at a water strider, you know, and at the center you can sort of see its reflection on the bottom? 
What do you see on the bottom? Hopefully you get to see some. The shadow and the, the feeder. Yeah, the shadow of the feet are significantly larger than the physical size. Yeah, they look like these huge circles. Mm -hmm. And what is that? It has all these like little hairs mm -hmm. on the feet that if you think about like little hairs, as the fluid gets like thicker, it's not going to act like a suit. It's going to act more like a paddle, right? So they're they're actually deforming that surface tension. But um, and if we wanted to do something like that, like walk on the water. Um, I have the exact number in the thing that um, you're going to get when you go out there. But I think we would need something like 70 miles of uh, <laughs> surface if we weighed 130 pounds. So, so when you think about how these creatures have adapted, it's pretty amazing. But aquatic entomology, um, and it was actually um, an entomologist who was um, once again a fly fisherman. But most of the pictures that are on the card that you have or that are on the like booklet that you're, you'll get are from this book. They have like great drawings of all of the things in their life histories, which is really cool. Um, and this is a relatively new book, this guide to common freshwater invertebrates. Great natural history information. We about the new stone, the things that live at the air water interface, and we talked about the plankton, the things that are sort of at the mercy of the currents flowing in there. Um, the necton are things that can swim through the water. There's several fish um, that you might come across in Stewart Creek, and these are in the little booklet um, that you know sort of describes the sculpins and the um, yeah, those folks. And in terms of the studies that I've researched, steelhead have been present in the little creeks here with the um, arrows. Are there steelhead here or are they rainbow trout? You know? Yeah, I'm not sure. Anybody else? Yeah. If, you, if there are fish here, they're probably steelhead. I don't know how far they make it up this way. Yeah, okay. Because we have so many great fish. Yeah. Um, and also newts when they swim. <laughs> and then there's things, the benthos, the stuff that lives on the bottom, right? And it has different ways of sort of hanging out there, attaching, or what's this bit right here? It made this. <laughs> this is a caddis fly bar, and they make all of these different fascinating cases. And they sort of hang out in them, do different things. Dragonfly naiad, rayfly naiad, and this little thing here. I think I may have a slide where I talk about that. Does anybody know what that is? Look at these little fans right here. It's attached to it. People know what that is? People know when it's like black fly season? That's a black fly larva, and they are amazing. <laughs> we'll talk about maybe the crayfish when we're out there a little bit. Here's a picture. This is a rock, and all these little tiny things are those black fly larva. And we're sticking onto that. So you know like when it's a really windy day, and you go to the beach, I mean, I think about this all the time, you know, the way that I trashed my skin when I was in junior high, like wanting to go to the beach and march back east and start working on my tan. And when it's windy, um, what do you do? You lie down because the closer you are to the ground, the less, the less velocity the air has. Well, it's sort of the same in water, and there's that sort of boundary layer that, you know, above it, it's like sort of higher velocity, and down below, it's sort of calmer. And these little creatures understand that in every single cell of their body. So what they're doing is they're attached, and they have these two feeding fans, and they're at exactly the right angle so that one of them is up outside of the boundary layer, the other is down in. So one of them is catching one stream of food, the other one is catching um, sort of a different type of stream. And they actually make sure that they um, lean in at such an angle that they create this little vortex here, see that? Mm -hmm. So that all of their weight is moved out of the stream and it's not getting caught in that little feeding sand. Mm -hmm. And as the velocity of the water increases, of course their angle is going to get lower because 
know, so as it. So just, I mean, just, just a little picture of some of the stuff that's going on out there. Very good. Start thinking about this. I learned a really cool thing today that I love. Could you share it? I was. I used to work in vascular biology research in atherosclerosis and heart disease. And that's a perfect picture of the internal carotid and the external carotid. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and actually, plaques form in the same places as the depositional zone oh, wow. at, the oh, at the areas of the erosional zone. And we used that exact same picture to talk about atherosclerosis. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <what? laughs> So when we talk a little bit about things in there, you know, we talk about predators and we talk about anomalous and parasites and herbivores. Um, there's in the stream there's piercing herbivores, but we also talk about because the um, base of the food chain is a little bit different. Like we talk about that sort of um, material that's decomposing. We talk about collectors and gatherers. We talk about scrapers. We talk about collectors that are filter feeders, mm -hmm. and all of this is in your little book, but we talk about shredders, things that are actually shredding stuff, and then there are a bunch of things that are wood eaters, you know, in that wood that's like food. So some of our shredders are the crayfish, the single crayfish that are out there, and also stonefly larvae. They're actually using your appendages to shred stuff and eat it. Mm -hmm. Some of our filters and collectors are the some may fly, and the black fly, and the some caddis flies. Some of our scrapers and grazers are um, like the little snails that we find out there. Also some beetles and beetle larvae are scrapers. Some of our fearsome predators are like giant water bite bugs and the um, dragonfly naiads. People know that they have these like extensible jaw that comes out and captures things. And newts. Um, this is a Dobson fly larva that's sometimes called a helgramite. Oh, hmm? has a piercing. Yeah. Right there. Right there. It's like this is a giant water bug. It, it, ah. So this water, um, giant water bug will actually pierce the fish or the frog or whatever, inject digestive enzymes, turn the whole inside into like a little slushy, and then suck it out. And they can be like about that big. They're also called toe biters. Uh, and they have a tendency to be found sort of around the edges in the quieter um, water. I mean, we very rarely get to see them, so it's so exciting when we do. Um, well, they like, pierce the toe, and it's, it's, it just hurts a little bit. It's not like, I, when I used to teach at UCSB, it was always interesting, and it seemed like it was like the football players that were the most scared. <laughs> Adult that has wings, 
Um, what are some of the benefits? Why do things like actually metamorphose in the first place? Yeah? Distribution, Distribution of resources. Imagine if you could say, okay, you know, my teenager is going to eat a completely different, you know, food supply than I do. I mean, so if you think about it, a lot of the things that we're seeing in the stream, um, some of them are only aquatic part of their life. They're only aquatic in the juvenile stage. Um, some of them are aquatic all their whole life cycle. So partitioning of resources is one um, really interesting um, thing to think about when you're thinking about metamorphosis. Uh, and here, people know what this is. This one up here, dragonfly. It's a damselfly. See the like sort of fleshy little tails. Dragonflies don't have that. Their gills are inside their rectum, as opposed to outside. So it's close to a dragonfly. It's a damselfly. What about this one? We've seen it a couple times with those abdominal gills. Mayfly. Mayfly larva. Yeah. And what about this one? <laughs> this is a dragonfly, and, um, and what you can't see in these, I have pictures later, is that they have this extensible, what they call a jaw, where this comes out, it has teeth at the end, and they catch things. It's like uh, one of the biologists um, before me at the Martin Griffith Reserve used to call it death by lower lip. <laughs> your little thing swimming around in the water. I mean, it would be like terrifying, actually, to be out there. We saw this a picture of this before. What's that? Mosquito. Mosquito. Yeah. And there's the mosquito pupa. Right here's a predaceous diving beetle larva. But it looks like it's doing the same thing piercing. It is. It's, well, it's 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 not piercing with a thing like that, but it has these like big mouth parts that it you know. Yeah, and here are the adults. There's the damselfly, there's the mayfly, there's the dragonfly, there's the mosquito, there's the diving beetle, there's the caddisfly. What's that dragonfly movie in the bottom of There? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, and so this is like called the heart or the wheel position, right, of dragonflies. And here, the top one is the male, and he has his claspers on the end of his abdomen that is hooked behind the female's head. Now, interestingly, in dragonflies, the um, where the sperm is is up here, and it's not really connected. So you'll see him like charge. Um, the sperm container basically, then he connects to a female and she goes and moves her abdomen up to where the sperm is and so that they're flying around um, in this heart or wheel position and that's what's happening. And if you look at some of the um, parts of the male dragonfly, what they call the secondary genitalia, um, there are these, these amazing structures and you're like, what is that all about? And what it's all about is what they're there for is to clean out all the sperm from other males in the oh, females so that yeah, it's their sperm that's actually fertilizing the eggs. We could, we could talk about dragons. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to mention that they're safely, I keep saying, I, uh, one, one year I'm going to do just a history, natural history of sex class. <laughs> So there's incomplete metamorphosis, and this is where you know things sort of look like what they're going to turn into as an adult, and they just keep molting and getting more you know adult uh, structures till the fifth instar, where you see the little wing pads if they're going to be um, aerial, and then the wings develop. So that's what we call incomplete metamorphosis. And all these, all these. Uh, they all take different amounts of time to go through. They all, and some of them, you know, we can, we've done a whole thing about which ones overwinter as adults, which ones overwinter as larvae, which ones overwinter as eggs, which ones overwinter as pupa, which ones overwinter as naiad, which is, a, you know, so so there's all sorts of different strategies depending on who you are. Um, I like this because um, here's a damselfly knife that's crawled out. Here the adult is coming out. You can see how the wings are these like little, you know, 
Here it's lying next to its old exoskeleton. Um, here the wings are getting pumped full of um, air. Here they are getting, you know, now they're almost longer than the body, and I think it might actually be eating. A lot of them will eat their own exoskeleton. If you find it, you know, and you hold it on your finger and watch the whole process, I can tell you from experience, it takes about an hour. Um, and you can, you can watch that whole... That's a damsel fly? Yeah, and now you can see there it is actually eating its... So this is a damsel fly naiad, but you can watch it with dragonfly naiads and um, other things like that. Here, I just wanted to show one thing that's really cool is these are all sort of different cases that the caddis fly larva can make. So, and you have the thing that's cool about Stewart Creek, we have like maybe one or two kinds of caddis flies down at the Martin Griffin Preserve, but you have many different species. And some of them make these like little log cabins. Some of them make these, you know, like beautiful pebble things. Some of them, you know, use different sized stones. This one, you can't really tell, but it's little tiny sand grains of all the same size. Some of them actually make cases that look like snails. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. How do they glue it together? They have like a substance that they actually are able to secrete that does it. Um, in fact, um, there are these entomologists in, down in, yeah. I think, in Mexico, where the woman is also a jewelry maker. And what they did is they replaced the, they, they made a stream in their house, and instead of stones in the stream, they put semi precious gems oh, and then cool. put the caddisflies in there so that the caddisfly larva made their houses out of the semi-precious gems. When they actually molted to adulthood, they would let them go and then she would take like a little bit of epoxy so it wouldn't come apart and just make sure that the caddisfly um, little case stayed in half. These are given to me by some of our volunteers and it's this was actually made by a caddisfly. And it's Yeah, but it's in essence a lot of stuff. Is but yeah, no, it's, 
Okay, so that's the difference between. So that's the difference. So here you see no larva, you see no pupa. You just see this molting getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then developing wing pads and stuff. Whereas um, when you look at this, you have an egg, then you have a larva, and that will molt and molt and molt until it gets to a terminal larva. And what is the purpose of that larva? It's to eat. Eat, 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 eat. I don't know if any of you have raised butterflies or moths, but you know, I always like to have them on my kitchen table and then you have this like frass all over that's like a caterpillar poop. Um, then they develop a pupa and um, metamorphose into a bill. Here's a mosquito. There's the raft of eggs. There's the larva. There's the pupa. There's the adults. What is the range of time for metamorphosis in some of the three? It really depends. Um, so that's what we were talking about. It depends upon whether your strategy is to overwinter as an egg or a larva or a pupa or an adult. So some of them can spend the entire winter as eggs or the entire rainy season. Some of them can spend the entire rainy season um, as a pupa. Some can spend the entire rainy season as an adult. Um, and then when the, the spring comes on or whatever, when it's time to change, a lot of it has to do with water temperature and light. So depending upon what's happening, you can actually, the same species can actually, you know, have a, a slightly different kind of the whole thing. So I'm not going to talk about this. We may talk about some of it next week. I just wanted to say that, you know, there's a bunch of major orders of insects and there's, um, we won't find all of them in the water. Um, and I think I might leave it at that. Although one of the things that I did want to talk about is um, well, not the ones that you highlighted in yellow. In yellow, yellow. yeah. So the, the mayflies, the ephemeroptera, the dragonflies and damselflies, stoneflies. You find true bugs, and those are things like the water striders and the back swimmers and the water boatmen, um, the toe biters. Um, <laughs> we find beetles. Uh, we find caddis flies, we find dogs and flies, and we find true flies. And one of the things I wanted to mention, um, if you haven't talked about it yet, one of the things that I just love words, and I love where words come from, and I love how words get used, and I love, and when I was learning all of this, one of the things that made it a whole lot easier for me, this is called the Dictionary of Word Roots and Combining Forms. So if you look at ephemeroptera, you know that P-T-E-R-A, if you looked it up in here, it would be wings, right? So all of these terra, opteras, are wings. But if you look at, I bet you everybody has a sense of what ephemera might mean. If you look it up here, it means for a day or temporary. So mayflies are for a day or temporary. They are only adults for 24 hours or a little bit more. And that's why when we see them come out as adults, we talk about patches. All of them at once. And if you think about, if you're only going to be an adult for a day, you'd want to be able, and what does it mean to be an adult? It means you're at the point where you want to reproduce. So if you're only going to get to do that for a day, you want to make sure that there's a bunch of other folks around that you can do it with. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> so they're all Twine, twist, braid, strike, twisted. So I think that that might have to do with at the top of their wings. They always look like, you know, they got stuck in the 80s with those shoulder pads. <laughs> yeah, these little shoulder pads on them, and I think there's like a little twist right there. Um, huh? It's called the Dictionary of Word Roots and Combining Forms. And Julia, this is my, the library of MGP's copy. I own one. Julia owns a personal one. And we had a little foray into the library and realized that the one in there may be missing. So I think it's on the list to get ordered. But it's a really you cool one. You should buy one. You can get them used for really cheap if you're a word of bio and you want to start looking into word. Yeah. And if you get addicted to Latin names, which I'm sorry to report does happen to people. Yeah. <laughs> this is like you really. Spend hours. Yeah. And it's kind of cool, like, if you do, I mean, you know, like, when you talk about not really, I mean, sometimes it's really cool to bring those in when you're with the kids. I mean, kids know Latin names. They know Tyrannosaurus Rex. They know, like, different things like that. So sometimes it's kind of cool to 
throw one or two of those in there because I don't know if you know you were like this when I was a kid. I was probably insufferable, but I would love like you know knowing a couple of those words. Being able to, oh well, what what is this? This is. I mean, my mother like was. My parents were. You know, I got grounded once for. I think saying the word ass, you know, we didn't, we didn't use any, and my mother, when she would sew, she would have a sewing thing down in the basement, and she'd be there, and she'd be furiously, you know, sewing, swearing, except for we weren't allowed to swear, so I'd, I'd sit on the stairs and listen to her, and I'd go, Sam Bucus Canadensis, so I would walk around saying Sam Bucus Canadensis all the time, and one of my teachers said, why are you talking about raspberries, or was something like that, so. <laughs> so, the scientific things kind of in handy when you're a kid. Um, so, what I would like to do is we're going to get ready to get go out in the field. Um, like I said, the creek is more of a day where you can just kind of explore. I have a booklet that has um, a lot of the stuff I talk about, and it looks like your trail card that has you know all of the creatures, but inside are the biographies of a lot of those creatures, so if you're curious about that. The other thing that I have is um, a little treasure hunt of things that I want you to be looking for when you're out of the creek. And what we're going to be doing is we'll go out in a group, but when we get there, you're going to be dividing up with your into small groups with your mentors. And those of you whose mentors aren't here, I think everything's been arranged so you will know who you're going to be with. Um, you'll get that um, when you go out there. Mentors, um, this is a time where, you know, I gave, I don't know that people will get through everything I put on the treasure hunt. I tried to um, put a bunch of stuff on there that would, you know, excite curiosity and maybe get people to ask questions. Um, but we want to spend a significant amount of time just exploring. Uh, one question that I had is sometimes when we do this, we are able to actually eat, even though we don't do this with the kids we're able to eat lunch along the stream. So I'm going to put it out there. It's like 11, 15, so by the time we get there, it'll probably be quarter of 12, when you think about that. I think that what might make sense is to just go out there, be in your small group, have your treasure hunt, explore, eat lunch when your group decides to eat lunch. And what I would like to do is to then gather up at the end so that we can all talk, I mean, at the stream. Um, talk about what we um, have discovered and learned and found, what questions we have. One of the things that's really cool that I'm always so grateful for is um, folks here and with Julia and everybody, they've arranged to have tables set up down there. There's microscopes down there. Jared and Richard Watson have gone ahead of time and looked for cool things. I would say definitely spend some time checking out the cool things that they have found, but that in no way excuses you from going and finding your own cool things. So there's going to be gonna cool work. things down there. I know they have a tendency to draw, but what I would like, there's like some things in your, places in your treasure hunt where you, you know, are asked to find what, talk about, or, you know, what you found at the tables and stuff like that. What I would do is, it's a very large group, you mentors, um, can space out when you decide to visit the tables and look at all of that stuff. What I would do is just to try to space it out. So, actually, this worked out well. What do you think those are? I would spend this Did you find that was too short? Okay. Oh, no. So they're the only ones that are Okay. Once you start, for me, what it is is when I first get there, and I think it's the same with the kids. You, like it's cool, but you're sort of like a little richy, you know, uchy, and and then you start looking, and then you start looking a little more, and then you start looking a little more, and then you get to the point where you're like looking, and it's like, well, that one could be living, you know. And as it gets tinier and tinier, what were some of the people's favorite things that they? One, my favorite thing was that I found this little, it looked to me just like a tick in water. and uh, But then uh, we decided it, it was something else. So I brought it up and put it under here, and it just was transformed, completely yeah. transformed into this 
like really beautiful bug and it was or <laughs> whatever you call it and it, was it and it was and when it was in the frisbee it was just this like pinpoint yeah. of a huh. wow. but it was beautiful under the microscope yeah it's a this world is so amazing and that's one of the you know that's one of the things that's sort of hard some of the smaller things to actually get the kids to be able to see that i'm looking at um for the Martin Griffin Preserve, and Julie and I maybe will want to talk about this, looking at a certain kind of waterproof cabinet that we can build out at the pond, or maybe have one down here, where we can actually store a couple of microscopes that if you wanted to bring them out, you could um, actually use them with the kids. Although, hand lenses and... These um, things are cool. Also, can you give me that black thing? Because I can't drop up and down. I carry this around in my backpack, and it folds up and it's light mm -hmm. and then you basically have it's not super high magnification but you have a pretty you know a little dissecting scope that you can put a pretty much anywhere and um and it works mm. and the way it folds up it kind of protects it because of the i mean i slip it into a little thing but that's kind of a cool thing what else yeah um i took the point of a little stick and i tapped it there was like a whole meadow filled with uh, water striders and i tapped it and a few came over, and they were all interested. And then a few more, but there was like the head person. That, yeah. He was like first. The one in charge. Him. Him. And I kept tapping, and he was like, hey, I'll check it out. You know, yeah, it was the thing that went on. It was really fun. Isn't it cool yeah. that you read that little thing yeah. about, like, you know, sometimes I just carry just because it's hard to find a really smooth stick that creates the right kind of ripples I'll carry a couple bamboo skewers and if you put those in and make the right kind of ripples you can get the water striders to come in you know it's kind of a little thing to do or you know what the other thing I mean they're predators you know pretty much um if what uh, this sounds awful maybe but <laughs> if I find a mosquito in the middle of feeding I will try and take it out and not kill it and I just drop it right in the pool with the water striders oh my god okay. carnage <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a cool thing to do too. What else? I saw a hand back there that somebody would, you know. Yeah. I was just going to ask where you got that magnifying. You know, I'm trying to remember because I just pick up things like that when I see them because yeah. I think, oh well, it may work, it may not. Let me try it. Out. I love those other things that are here too. Sometimes we sell those in the bookstore. What else do people see that? Yeah. A sculpin. The sculpin. Mm, Isn't yeah. it cool to yeah. actually see like a vertebrate? I mean, we found the frogs too. What else? Anything else that I'm like still like tripping on this leaf that Julia found that was completely gelatinous that the like water would drip out of it but it's still I mean yeah. what was that I picked up an alder leaf like this, about this big and I turned it upside down because that's a micro habitat where you find things and I touched it and there was probably a third of an inch of clear gelatin mm -hmm. on the whole leaf <coughs> and when I turned the leaf sideways the water dripped out but the gelatin stayed and Gwen walked over and I said I've never seen anything like this and she hasn't either now I wonder if it's some kind of I mean it's totally transparent could perfectly see the bottom of the leaf so mm -hmm. No, so like that there was and I think every single day you go out, you should find a thing that you've never yeah. seen before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paying attention. Yeah. yeah. What causes the oils that you see on the surface in some of the calm areas? You see like a slick, a little bit of oil. A lot of it is rotting vegetation. A lot of things have, like bay leaves, a lot of other things have oils in them. And as they start to decompose, um, you see things that look like mini oil slicks. So that's what a lot of that is, I think. Any other questions? One thing that's kind of cool and one thing that I like to do and I've done when I hike with the kids and stuff is, you know, sort of before, and I was going to do this with you earlier, but I was in the process of editing so much out of my presentation that I wanted to tell you about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that I missed a couple of things. But one thing that's, that's kind of cool to think about before you head someplace like this is to, before you go, think about what questions come up. You know, sometimes getting the kids to think about that, like, you know, hey, we're going to go to this place. What, you know, what do you wonder about? What kinds of things? And so sometimes having those, you know, sort of in the forefront when you go out there, then one of the things that we're not great at doing, all of you are, and you're becoming greater at it, but one of the things that I feel like we lose in our current culture is that great ability of folks that are mentors, of folks that are leaders, to um, harvest 
the stories that come up for the kids when they're here. So just allowing the time to put sort of the, as we talked about before, the information dispensation part of you, to like just be quiet and ask the story, like, you know, what what is coming up for the kids? What did they notice? Um, and the other thing that kind of gets them going, and Joe may have talked about this um, last week because he talks about it a fair amount, but relating what you see to something personal. Like, I love this because, you know, is there some reason that you might love it? Or, you know, I, I mean, it's just so, so getting it to the point where it's not like, oh, well, this is a water strider or whatever. It's like, oh my God, it's a water strider. And I love these because they have like these little legs that take, or, you know, or there was a time when I saw one or, you know, things like that, that actually connect it and make it personal and make it safe for them to have those connections too. It's kind of a cool thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that came up today or that you have questions about? Um, how many people actually had a chance to <coughs> do their little treasure hunt? Oh, so. Some of it. <laughs> Congratulations! That means that you were actually out there looking. I would say um, one of the things that's kind of cool that I would suggest is maybe um, come and have a little extra time or whatever after your regular class and stuff and just spend a little bit of time with yourself or with a, a buddy from your class doing that because it's kind of a good exercise and one of the things I really like to do we had this conversation with the mentors is you know I get you wouldn't know it here I'm standing on a log talking but I have experienced in my life just shyness to the point where I've been debilitated I've like had huge difficulties talking in front of groups of people and I figured out ways to get around mm -hmm. it but one of the ways is that I <laughs> get a little teary. I so love the things in this world that aren't able to talk human. And I feel like anything that we can do, that we get people listening to those voices and figuring out how to understand what they're saying. So that's one of the things that's gotten me past my... And so a lot of times, you know, what I would do, especially more in the beginning of teaching about this stuff, is I would actually go and I would hang out with the water striders and I would say, well, what do you want me to share about you? What are you trying to say in terms of this whole picture and how are you connected to everything? So I would highly recommend either here or someplace where you live, you know, spending a little bit of time with the treasure hunt, but also spending a little bit of time just listening and figuring out how to be the translator for the kids that are coming here. Because I think that, you know, a lot of us here are um, part of a bridge generation. You know, we actually experienced childhood, a lot of us differently, where we had that unstructured time out there in places. That's one of the things that connects a lot of people to this. And we're also part of the generation that's now figuring out how to incorporate technology into the way that we live. But a lot of kids that are coming um, don't... I was talking to a co-worker the other day who's 26, and I was explaining to her, you know, well, when I started in the work world... <laughs> Um, I used to like, you know, handwrite a note, give it to somebody who typed it up and put it in an envelope and wrote an address on it and put a stamp on it and stuck it in the mail. And then it took four or five days to get somewhere. And then the person who got it opened up the envelope. They read it. They wrote something. Somebody else typed it. They put it in an envelope. You know. So that in it, it, it basically a communication like that could take 10 to 14 days. Whereas now we're used to doing like 150 of them before breakfast. You know, it's crazy. So we are part of this bridge generation that, you know, understands time in a different way. I'm not saying one is better or one is worse, but I feel like those things that I care so much about need us to remind people that they're there. So mm -hmm. I'm a little bit on my soapbox, but because I get to stand Trees on this log. Tree, <laughs> tree log and all of you are looking out there and I was like so enjoying hearing all of the conversations today as people were exploring. I just wanted to say that, like give that to the kids. So, so Robert Lewis Stevenson wrote a poem called Looking Glass River. So if you would take a moment in this wonderful energy of coming back from the creek and put down your, all your things and physically, mentally, metaphorically just listen to these words that were written about 150 years ago. But streams are timeless places and so it still applies. 
Smooth it glides upon its travel, here a wimple, there a gleam. Oh, the clean gravel, oh, the smooth stream. Sailing blossom, silver fishes pave pools as clear as air. How a child wishes to live down there. We can see our colored faces floating on the shaken pool, down in cool places, dim and very cool. Till a wind or water wrinkle, dipping marten, plumping trout, spreads in a twinkle and blots all out. See the rings pursue each other, all below grows black as night, just as if mother had blown out the light. Patience, children, just a minute. See the spreading circles die. The stream and all within it will clear by and by.